Hello, today we're going to be talking about the social studies part of the 4391 exam. More specifically, we're going to be talking about the competency one, which is social studies instruction, and competency three, geography and culture. Let's get into it. Some other helpful resources that I always want to share is Crash Course. Crash Course uh, does an amazing job of going in more in depth in each section that you need to study for. So I highly recommend checking them out. I will include a link in here so that's easier for y'all to find them if you're watching this on YouTube later. So that was the preview of their U.S. history, Oops. but they also go into yeah, economics, world history, and a whole lot of other stuff. They even cover some science and um, other topics if you need those as well. So what is competency one all about? So competency one is, like we said, the social science instruction. So this means that the teacher is going to, ha you have to be able to understand and apply social solid science knowledge and skills to plan, organize, implement instruction and access learning. We've noticed so far, most of our competencies ones for each of the sections have been about teaching that subject. So we're going to go into a little bit about how to teach social science and what it involves. In order to do that, we have to understand the content that we're going to be teaching and the teaks. We have to be able to understand what it means to vertically align those teaks among each other. We do that in each of the subjects. We also need to understand and use social studies terminology correctly and come up with some effective instructional strategies and activities and technology that we can use to teach these students. So there's a few, there's, a few different discipline, various disciplines of social studies, as you can see listed on the left. We're going to go into a little bit today, mainly focusing on, um, like we said, on geography and that's so teaching social science. But I did want to give you the overview of what all is involved in social studies. So the different teaks we need to worry about. These are the different, uh, there's eight different essential knowledge and skills teaks that are covered in social studies instruction. The first one is history. Now, history is the study of past events, people, and cultures. It focuses on, on a historical thinking skills, such as chronological reasoning, historical interpretation, and historical research. Our second one is geography. Now, geography is the examination of the Earth's surface and its relationships between people and their environments, emphasizing spatial thinking, map skills, and the impact of human activities on landscapes. Our third one we're going to talk is economics. Now that's going to be your exploration of of principles of econ. We're going to, it's an exploration of principles of economics, including supply and demand, market systems, personal finance, and global economic issues. And you want to make sure you're preparing students to for economic decision making in their own life, because we always want to make sure we're parent, preparing our students. Government is the analysis of political systems, structures, and processes. It fosters an understanding of citizenship, rights, responsibilities, and the foundations of democratic governance. Uh, citizenship is the development of civic knowledge, skills, dispositions necessary 
for informed and active participation in society. It promotes civ civic engagement and social responsibility. Culture we know is the how people live, how they impact others. This is going to include their religion, how um, their language, their education, clothing, what they eat. Oops, sorry, I clicked too fast. Then we have science, technology, and society and social study skills. So let's get into this. So vertical alignment of teeks. What is vertical alignment? Vertical alignment is making sure that what we're teaching them in second grade is built on from first grade and then it's ready for to help them when they get into third grade. We want to make sure that each subject we're teaching helps them to grow each year and that we're getting a little bit deeper each year into the subject so they can continue learning more and more. We want to uh, ensure continuity and coherence. We're going to do this by aligning curriculum vertically. Educators create a clear pathway of learning progression from one grade level to the next. We want to build on that previously acquired knowledge and skills. Second, we want to make sure we're facilitating a depth of understanding. Whenever we're vertically aligning, we're allow it allows us educators to scaffold their learning experience so that we're ensuring that students develop that deep understanding of key concepts and competency over time. It also helps us to support differentiated instruction. By understanding the trajectory of learning across the grade levels, we can make sure that we are tailoring instruction to meet that diverse need of students and provide appropriate challenges and support. It promotes uh, assessment validity. A vertically aligned curriculum ensures that the assessments accurately measure student mastery of their essential knowledge and skills. It also helps reflect the progression of their learning from foundational to advanced levels. We, it enhances our collaboration among educators because it encourages us to collaborate and communicate with other teachers within and across the grade levels. It fosters a shared understanding of instructional goals and strategies. And also aligns with educational standards. So vertical alignment ensures that the curriculum and instruction are aligned within state standards, such as the TEKS, and promotes accountability and quality in our education. So as much as we hate those TEKS, we know they're important. So let's look at the different learning styles and social studies instruction. We all know that we have different types of learners in our classroom. Every student cannot learn the same way. So we want to make sure we're adapting what we teach to help them be able to learn. Whenever we're setting up that lesson, we're making sure that we include aspects for each type of learner so that we're reaching each student. It's going to help us engage and motivate our students. Whenever we tailor instruction to accommodate the diverse learning styles, it's going to increase their student engagement and motivation as students are more likely to connect with and retain the information that in their preferred format. It's also going to help us support differ differentiation because we're going to be able to recognize and accommodate the different learning styles, and it's going to allow us to provide multiple entry points and pathways for those students to access the content and ensure that all learners can succeed. It's going to help us facilitate comprehension and retention because it's going to provide various strategies that align with the student's learning styles and improve comprehension. And it's going to help them retain that content so they're more likely to remember and re understand the information if it's presented in those multiple ways. It's going to encourage critical thinking and creativity. It's going to, uh, if whenever we're incorporate, it's going to incorporate a variety of learning styles and encourage students to think critically and make connections and apply knowledge in different contexts, fostering creativity and deeper understanding of social studies concepts. And I included on the slide a few different ways that we can do it. Like our visual learners, they're going to benefit from those visual aids. So we're going to make sure we're including maps and charts and timelines and all the different things. You're going to include those pictures of those people. You're going to help them any way you can with those visual aspects. Our auditory learners, they're going to get a lot from our lectures and discussions, but we can also include debates and audio recordings. 
pull up the speeches by MLK. Let them actually listen to little clips from the past and let them hear those primary sources because that's going to really impact those learners. Our kinesthetic learners need those hands-on activities. So why not do some role-playing about what happened? Let them actually act out some of the things that you're discussing so that they can see what it feels like. Get um, some of those historical artifacts and actually let them interact with them. Our reading and writing learners, they wanna, they're going to learn a lot from our textbooks, but also bring in those articles and primary sources. Have them take notes. Let them write essays and reflections on what they're learning about. One of the easiest ways to connect with those students is whenever you're doing your lecture, give them a post-it. Give every kid in your class a post-it. Let them take notes or draw or what they need to do. Say, okay, today we're going to be talking about the Civil War. I want you to think about how the two different sides of the war were different. While I'm talking, I want you to make notes on your post-it. You can draw a picture or write whatever is easier for you to help you remember. Because at the end, I'm going to ask you to help me compare those two sides. And this will help engage those students. But it's also going to give those reading and writing learners and even your visual learners a way to connect with that. All right, so let's get into some questions so we can practice what we've been talking about and put it into use. So which of the following is the most important, appropriate tool for teaching students this the graphic concept of hemispheres? So the first thing I always tell y'all to do is we're going to look at our question and we're going to highlight. We want to make sure we're highlighting e any key information so that we know we remember where it's at and we're not missing any words. So I'm looking for an appropriate tool for teaching students the geographic concept of hemispheres. I'm going to highlight that we're talking about hemispheres. We're looking for a tool. So let's go through our choices and see what we think about each one. Web-based encyclopedias. Now, encyclopedias are amazing. They give us lots of different information. But an online encyclopedia merely makes the textbook's information electronic. This is going to be great for their research projects, but isn't really going to help them with that concept of hemispheres. They may be able to read more about hemispheres, but it's not going to provide a concrete way of, of showing it to them. Uh, digital Global Positioning Systems, or GPS. GPS is suited for helping teach latitude and longitude, but it doesn't really show them as well the concept of hemispheres. Internet travel blogs. Blogs are not always the most valid source of information. They're fun to look at, but they're not going to be a good resource for our students to use. Not Especially not for teaching the concept of hemispheres. So our best option is going to... Sorry, a pen's wanting to keep writing. Our best option is going to be our online three-dimensional maps. Um, the online three-dimensional map allows the students... To view the Earth from many different viewpoints besides our traditional flat representations. This is like viewing an online globe. So you're able to point it out and show, let them turn it around if you don't have a globe in your hand and show them the different hemispheres. All right, let's go to our next question. Oh. I still only had one question for that one. Sorry, guys. thought I had more on that section, but that's okay. What is geography? Geography is going to be our study of our Earth's landscapes, environments, and the relationship between people and their surroundings. When we think geogra geography, most of us think, okay, I know what geography is. That's just looking around. That's the outside. We often forget that there's a human side of geography, too. So I want to make sure we touch on that today of what human geography is and why it's important as well. Now, understanding geography helps us make sense of the world around us. We do. We all know about natural phenomena, but we also need to consider those human activities and how we're connected among the globe because of the geography. Now, 
Oops, want to click. So there's five different themes of geography, and we're going to try and get into each of them today. We have location, place, our human and environmental interaction, movement, and regions. So we're going to talk first about physical geography, because I think we have a lot to discuss there. Physical geography is going to focus, like we said, on those natural features and processes of the earth, including those landforms, climate, vegetation, and ecosystems. What does our earth look like? How does it feel? Why is this important? How do we impact our earth? And how does our earth impact us? Two of the concepts that people seem to confuse pretty easily is geography and location. Because, especially with our students, the con the two concepts are used almost interchangeably whenever they're discussing about geography. Oh, that's where I, li where I live is this place. Well, that's not exactly geography. So we're going to talk about the two difference between the two. Whenever we talk about geography, physically, we're going to talk about where it locates and identifies the Earth's surface features and explores human thrive in their locations. Whereas whenever you're talking about the physical location, you're talking about exactly where are you, where on the placement of the hemispheres and the continents, what's your GPS. On the for, geog for the geography cultural side, you're going to talk about the influence of the environment on human behaviors and activities. And with location, we also have the political side, the divisions within the continents that designate various countries and legal boundaries. All this political side is this is whenever you're thinking of a political, for example, like a political map, where is your city outlined? Where is your, where's the state border? Where are your lines that divide you? All right, so let's talk about some different tools that we're going to use in geography. We, we've all seen maps. We know that they're the visual representation. There's different types of maps we can use, like the political map, thematic maps, and satellite maps. We're going to go into maps a little deeper later and look at some of the different types of maps and what they mean. We also have the geographic information system. This is computer-based tools that are used for capturing, storing, analyzing, and displaying spatial data. Um, we don't talk about these as often. They're mainly used whenever they're doing urban planning or emergency response. So for the most part, we don't deal with those on a regular basis like we do maps. Remote sensing is the collection of data about, above Earth, about Earth's surface from airborne or satellite sensors. These are really cool to be able to show your students because you can actually pull up satellite foot, footage that shows what the earth looks like whenever a tornado hit or whenever environment the environment changes being able to have that big overview is a, is great to show your students cuz it just gives them a deeper learning and a deeper appreciation of the ge geography around them and most of them think it's cool that they can see the clouds i mean it's a completely different perspective than what they're used to seeing Global Positioning System, or your GPS. Most of us are familiar with this. We use it to get everywhere we're going. Or at least I know I do. Without GPS, I'd be completely lost most of the time. So this is going to be your satellite navigation system that provides location and time information to users on Earth's surface. So it helps us to get around. All right, so let's look at some different map terms because the terminology is going to be important for us to teach our students. We always want to be including those vocabulary words because it's going to help increase their knowledge, and those are the words that are going to show up on their test. So we know we have uh, our latitude lines that are going to run. They're going to be shown north to south, and you can see right here how they run. The one that's going to be found in the middle of the Earth is going to be called the equator. It's going to divide the northern and southern hemispheres. 
Now our longitude lines are going to run from west to east. They go up and down. Oops, sorry, that decided to click instead of trying to sneak ahead too fast. And it's going to go from 0 to uh, 180 from east to west. It's good for you to familiarize yourself with the longitude and latitude and how to read it. Um, if someone were to give you a longitude and latitude line on a for, for a coordinate, you should be able to find where that is on a map. You may not know the exact location, but if I tell you that I uh, ask you what city is located at 43 degrees north, 76 degrees west, you should be able to, given a map, you should be able to tell me about what city is located there. Because there's a good chance that something like that would show up on the test because they want to make sure that you know, okay, if I'm 47 degrees north, I'm no, I'm about right here. If I'm going to be, and let's see, this would be a, probably about 70 degrees east. hundred, Yeah, probably about 70 degrees east. So you should be able to know how to locate somewhere on a map and be able to pick that out for your exam. There's a very high chance a question like that to show up. All right, location. Let's talk about the different ways location is discussed. We have our absolute location. This is the exact position on Earth's surface using latitude and lo longitude. For example, if I told you I was going to the woodlands, we know the, the woodlands is a location in Texas, but if I want to give you the absolute location of that, I'm going to tell you it's located at 30 degrees north, 95.4 degrees west. We don't talk with absolute location usually. It is important, for example, if, I, if I'm flying an airplane, I'm going to need this exact at this absolute location to be able to make sure I land exactly where I'm supposed to. If I'm driving in my car, I don't need this exact uh, absolute location. I'm going to be able to use a more relative location. Relative location is going to be the location of the place in relation to other places. We can see that right here relative we can see that part of that word for relation to help us remember so some of the key words that will help us know that they're talking about relative locations you might see north south east west of you might say between next to so for example houston texas is southeast of austin texas the woodlands are close to houston so you want to really want to teach students the importance of both and when they might need to know both. And for our testing purposes, if they're asking you for the relative location, they might ask give you an example and ask you, is this the relative or absolute location? All right, so let's talk about some different types of maps. Um, I should have a picture on here of the four main different types of maps that we see or that we might be exposed to either on the test or even in our classrooms. So our political map is the one we see most often whenever we're teaching our students the states. The political map is going to show the clear boundaries between the different locations. It's usually going to show your capital cities and any important political Think government-based parts of the map. Thematic maps are going to be vary a lot more differently because they are going to be based off a theme. So, for example, the ones I show you right here, and I know I don't have a big picture of them, the top one shows you the different population. And the bottom ones, I can't even read that what it says, but they're going to show you be based off theme. It might be how fast people travel to the West. It might be based off what areas liked cheeseburgers the most. Whatever your theme is, these will all be based on the theme. Our physical map is going to show that physical geography that we were talking about at the beginning. So we use those a lot whenever we're trying to show kids how the world is different and what the, whoops, sorry. 
and how it might be laid out. They kids tend to like that kind of map because of the fact that it's colorful. Our top uh, topographic maps is this one at the bottom right. Now, this map have many multiple uses in the present day. We use any type of geographic planning or large scale architecture, um, earth sciences, and many other geographical disciplines use them. They use them for mining and other earth based endeavors. Um, the topographic map is going to show the locations in the form of hills, valleys, streams, and other features. It's going to show you where the topography changes or the height of the land changes. It's going to sh illustrate the shape and elevation of the different surface features. And it's going to have contour lines to show you how it goes up. This is important if you're trying to walk across an area. Maybe you're hiking in the you're hiking in a local park. You're going to want to look at a topographic map because if you're hiking, depending on where you're hiking, it may be a beautiful flat area, super easy to walk, or you may be trying to go up two miles. So those contour lines are going to be very, very important. Um, what we need to remember if we're looking at a topographic map is how close together are those contour lines. If the lines are spread out very far apart, that means it's very slowly going up or slowly going down. Now, the closer those lines get together, the faster it is changing, the faster it is going up or down. So whenever you're looking at, if it gives you an example of a topographic map on your test, keep in mind that if the lines are really, really close together, the contour lines are really close together, that means there's going to be a very steep change in altitude. All right, geographic skills and methods. What do I, we need to know? All right, map reading. This is going to be the interpretation of map symbols. Um, you're going to begin this in all your grades. They need to know how to look at the map. They need to know what a scale is. They need to know what a legend is, what a compass is. And they need to ha know how to use these to and how to get information from them. For our geographic inquiry, we want to make sure we're asking having students ask geographic questions and we're teaching them how to collect and analyze that data. It's because then they need to be able to draw their own conclusions to be able to understand the patterns and processes in the world. Spatial analysis. This is the examination of patterns, distributions, and relationships across geographic space. You're gonna, you, we want to make sure they know how to use maps, the statistics, and other data to be able to answer questions. We also want to make sure we're using some field work. We want our students to be able to do some direct observation and data collection in the field. This means maybe you're getting to go to the park, maybe they're getting to interview people, or maybe they're doing some kind of research problem, project to help them learn. We don't. We want them to be connected to real life. We don't want it just to be that geography is looking at a map. We want there to be that connection to real life always. I told you we were going to talk about the physical geography and the human geography. So human geography is going to examine the spatial patterns and processes of the human population. What we need to know about that is that population is population, culture, economic activities, and urbanization. All four of these concepts are going to be important aspects of human geography. Population is how are people spread out? Are you in a very rural or, or urban area? Do your kids know what rural, rural and urban mean? Do they know those t different terminology? Is them how are we look are we looking at growth rates? Why did this area change so much? Why did it suddenly grow? We want to make sure we're discussing culture, which like we said before is the beliefs, customs, language, religion, and traditions that shape and make a society what they are. What makes you American? So our e economic activities, this is going to be your production, distribution, and consumption of goods. 
It's going to include agriculture, industry, and trade. And then urbanization is our growth and development of cities. This is also going to include the how is it planned for, the infrastructure, and the issues that arise because of it being an urban area. So let's get into some questions now so we can practice what we've been talking about. Which of the fo following statements best describes the continuing row of famil fam familial, I can't even speak today, of oral storytelling traditions in many cultures around the world? The first thing I always say is highlight your question. What is important on this question? So we want to look at, we want to make sure they're describing the continuing role of this oral storytelling tradition in the different cultures around the world. All right, so let's look at our answer choices and see what we think about each one. Stories have become the primary means by which cultures interact with one another in an increasingly globalized world. So this one's going to be incorrect because there are many different means by which cultures interact. And storytelling is only a small portion of them. When we think, right now we interact in so many different ways, especially since the internets came out. There are thousands of ways you connect with people every single day without realizing it. Just the way we share our culture with them in so many different ways. I can go online right now and talk to someone in Japan or someone in Italy and ask them for recipes to cook for dinner tonight. Ask them about their favorite music. I can do all of these things just by getting online with the click of my fingers. I don't have to use storytelling. That's not our only primary means anymore. So that's going to make this answer right here wrong. Let's look at this one. New advances in technology have made oral traditions largely irrelevant in most cultures around the world. <laughs> Storytelling is still important. Even though we've had a lot of advances in technology, even though we have the internet, we still want to, storytelling is still very, very important, especially in other areas of the world where technology isn't as active. So it continues to be important despite the advances of technology. So that's going to make this one. Religious groups utilize storytelling mainly to discredit the beliefs of other religions and cultural practices. There's a lot I don't like about this answer choices. Um, religions engage in storytelling mainly to transmit their values and ideas but <laughs> rather than to discredit other faiths. Religions want to use their storytelling to share their what they believe, not just to discredit others, but so that everyone knows what they believe and how they believe. So our last choice was oral traditions serve as a means of transmitting knowledge of cultural practices and societal norms to others. Yes, this one's going to be correct because the family use, unit uses storytelling to transmit the knowledge of culture and society in which it exists. That's a lot of words, but really all it means is that, yes, it is important. We do, whenever we're talking to our kids, if you have kids, or if you're talking to your grandparents, we do use a lot of those oral storytelling methods. That's how we learn how our grandparents lived. That's how we teach our kids what's important to us, what's important to our culture, how we, what we value, what makes us us is this oral storytelling and being able to share it with the, those that are important to us. Which of the following events was a result of human interaction with the environment during the Spanish colonial era of Texas history? So this question actually digs into making you look at how were humans impacted. So let's look at our question and do our highlighting because we always start with that highlighting. So which of the following events was a result of human interaction with the environment? That tells me what kind of conflict I'm looking at, humans versus environment, during the Spanish colonial era of Texas history. This time period is important because it tells us the when. And right here, this is important because it's going to tell us the type of conflict we're looking for. 
so the construction of presidios near the church. There are many means by which the cultures interacted. Sorry, switch it over to the wrong, I was on the wrong question. Um, presidios were built to, the construction of presidios near churches, the presidios were built to protect the missions. So it really didn't, let's go make that one. Right. The conversion of American Indians to Christianity. This does have to do with the human interaction part, but it doesn't have to do with the environment. It only hits on one side of this equation. It only hits on the human interaction, not the environment side of the equation. The creation of alkalades for well, settlements. The alkal... Al I'm, I'm probably saying this wrong. I think it's alkades are judges used in civil settlements. So yes, this is important for the human interaction part, but it's not going to actually help with the environment side. So once again, it's only hitting one side of the equation. The building of aquasis for the missions. Aquasis were ditches that were dug to direct the water flow towards the missions. This is going to be where we are directly digging these ditches so that we have more water coming into the missions. It's going to check off both. Yes, it is us interacting with the environment. So that's going to make this one our correct answer. Texas rice farmers depend on water from the Colorado River to irrigate their crops. In times of severe drought, less water is released downstream, which sometimes results in inadequate irrigation and failed crops. To prevent such a loss, rice farmers sometimes plant alternative crops on their lands. This action is an example of... Let me get my highlighter back out. So let's see what they did. Texas rice farmers depend on water from Colorado to irrigate their crops. So we know the farmers need the water. In times of severe drought, less water is released downstream, which sometimes results in inadequate irrigation and failed crops. To prevent such a loss, the rice farmers plant their crops on alternative lands. This action is an example of, and we know they're only doing this to prevent a loss. Let me get my pen out. So they're adjusting the supply and demand. We're going to talk a little bit about supply and demand when we do the economic PowerPoint. But supply and demand is an economic concept that refers to the relationship between price and quantity. This question really refers to adapting to the environment change. It doesn't say that Whenever it rains less, people want less food. So they sell it for a different amount of money. It doesn't refer to that at all. So using non-renewable resources to improve farming. This one's going to be incorrect because the water is considered a renewable resource. In addition, the stem refers to the lack of water being the cause of the felled crops. So they're not really using a non-renewable resource. They're wanting to use that water, that, which is a renewable resource. They're just trying to figure out how to get, be able to use it differently. Modifying the environment to meet farming needs. If I was looking at this, these are the two that I would have to be stuck between. Because we have adapting to environmental changing or modifying the environment to meet different needs. Both of these answers sound very similar. They're both talking about how the environment's changing. What we want to look at is these keywords right here. One of them we're adapting, one we're modifying. So those verbs are going to make the difference in which answer choice we choose. So option D, the farmers are making a change to their behavior 
to adapt the environment. If we think about what they said, if we go back to right here, instead of they're not trying to reroute this water. Instead, they're changing where they grow their crops. They're changing what they do. So because the f farmers are making a change in their behavior to adapt to the environment, they're not modifying the environment to meet their farming needs. So that's going to make this one right here incorrect. The farmers are changing their, cho their choice of crop to change to that adapt environment, to be able to adapt to their environmental changes. Which of the following is true regarding the Tropic of Capricorn? It separates the northern and southern hemispheres. It separates the eastern and western hemispheres. It's the southernmost latitude at which the sun can appear directly overhead at noon. Or it's the northernmost latitude at which the sun can directly appear overhead at noon. So what we want to look at. I'm going to draw us a beautiful little circle right here. If I was taking this test, that's the first thing I was going to do. Is I'm going to try to remember where is the Tropic of Capricorn. Because that's going to be, be the knowledge that you need in order to answer this question. So our Tropic of Cap Capricorn is going to be a latitude line. And I'm going to see if I can draw... You get a different color so maybe we can see it. Just off the way. It's about right here, I believe. We know that the equator is going to be above it. Let me get a different line to show you my equator. So I'm going to put this as the TOC. That way we remember what that one is. And I'm going to get some blue. And these are not exact locations, guys. I'm just doing my best to show you in a quick drawing. That way we, because this is what I would do on the test to how I would answer this question. I know the equator is going to be the one that separates the north and the south, southern hemispheres. So I know that's going to immediately eliminate this. I know since it's a latitude line that that's going to automatically eliminate this answer because we need a longitude line in order to set up, to separate the eastern and western hemispheres. So that's going to leave me two two options. It's the southernmost latitude line at which the sun can appear directly overhead at noon, or it's the northernmost latitude line at which the sun can appear directly. The Tropic of Capricorn is below the equator. So that's going to make it the southernmost latitude at which the sun can appear at noon. Because it's below the equator, the sun's going to be higher in the sky. Right, so let's go into our next question. A second grade teacher is conducting a lesson on precipitation. Well, cannot read it. Sorry, guys. My stuff's in the way. And now I've lost my mouse. That appears so it's not in my way. A second grade teacher is conducting a lesson on precipitation and would like to show students differences in rainfall levels across Pennsylvania. Which of the following instructional materials would be, mo would be most effective in achieving this goal? So this question goes directly back to knowing which map is which. So I'm going to get my highlighter. We're looking at which one's going to show the differences in rainfall. That's the important thing we need to know. So remember we talked about our political map. If I had a political map of Pennsylvania, it's going to show the different cities in Pennsylvania. It might show the different counties in Pennsylvania. It's going to show the state line of Pennsylvania. It's not going to have anything about the rainfall on it. Our topographical map is going to be able to show you if there's any mountains in, 
and it's going to show you how that land goes up and down, how its elevation is going to change. It's not going to have anything to do with rain. Our physical map is going to show us where the rivers are, and it's going to show us those different physical features that we might find in Pennsylvania. I'm not familiar with Pennsylvania, so I can't tell you which physical features they have that you'd see. Our thematic map. Since we're looking at differences in rainfall, that's going to be the theme that might show up in a map. This is where we talked about there's different types of themes. So anything that shows up as, oh, that wouldn't show up on a regular map that I see, is going to end up pointing back to this thematic map. All right, let's look at our next question. In the third grade classroom, students are participating in a scavenger hunt game in which they locate the country of origin of various classroom items. Such an activity, of like, of activity is likely intended to begin developing students' initial understanding of which concept related to economics. So we're still looking at that human geography side. And we're wanting to introduce human geography and a, a different part of human geography to our students. So we're, they're going on the scavenger. We know it's third grade. I always tell you to highlight that grade. Even though it may not be relevant in some, que some of our questions, there's a lot of questions that knowing which grade and how old the students are is going to directly impact the choices that you pick in your answer. So we're always going to make a habit if we see a grade, we highlight it just in case. So in, our, in the third grade classroom, students are participating in a scavenger hunt game in which la they locate the country of origin of various classroom items. We're trying, we're going to begin developing. We've talked about before, what part of the lesson are you in? Are you beginning the lesson? Are you developing a concept that they already know and just reviewing it? Or are you trying to assess the, at the end of a concept? So we want, we know we're beginning their initial understanding of this concept related to economics. So now let's look at the different concepts that they show us and see if, what we think about each one. Scarcity and choice. Oops. Sorry, I can't even talk. Let me get a drink real quick, guys. So scarcity is going to refer to the finite nature and availability of resources. Um, well, choice refers to people's decisions about sharing and using those resources. So we really, whenever we're looking, thinking of doing this, we're saying how many of each item is available. For example, if you only put out a few of each item for the students to find, and they have to figure out how to share and allocate e these resources. It would be more about scarcity and choice. So that's going to make this answer wrong. Mark, let's, so let's look at our second one, market competition. Market competition takes place in markets. This means you have sellers and buyers. Typically, a few sellers compete to attract favorable offers from prospective buyers. Similarly, if, if intending buyers compete to obtain good offers from their suppliers. We don't, it, we're not having the students sell anything. We're not doing any kind of classroom store where they're having to compete against one another. My bracelets are better than your bracelets for this reason. So we don't have any kind of market competition going on. All right, so let's look at our next one, foreign policy. Foreign policy is how the government strategy of deals with other nations. Whenever we're talking about the students looking for the different items, we're not having them deal. We're not worried about how they're going to develop guide relationships with other classes or other schools. If we were talking about how does our class is rules impact other classes, then we might be looking, introducing that concept of foreign policy. International trade. 
If I go, if I look around, even just my bed, my office right now, a lot of the items that I have in my office were not made here in America. I can find items that were made in China. I can find items that were made in Japan, Taiwan, all these different areas. So the fact that they're looking for the country of origin or where things were made tells us we're looking at how it was traded. Oops. That's a big check mark, not an X. Sorry, guys. So kids are really good at telling you, oh, this was made so and such place. This was made such and such place. It's actually a great way to introduce this topic because kids love to be able to tell you where things were made and they get really excited to see it wasn't made here. So whenever you're getting them engaged in that activity, it's going to open the door for, well, if it was made in China, how come we have it? It was we're not, We don't live in China. How do you think it got here? What happened in order for us to receive this item? And you're going to be able to introduce this concept of international trade, that we trade our country trades with other countries to receive certain products. Whether we're, tr we're trading money for that TV. Right. So the which of the following is not one of the necessary characteristics of a geographical region. First thing I want to do is highlight that we're not. Because anytime we see the word not, we always highlight it. Because we want to make sure when we're doing our answer choices, especially if we're close to the end of the test and we're tired, we're not missing that word. Because if I miss that word and I only say which of the following is one of the necessary characteristics, oh, I know location is I'm done. And I'm just going to move on. I may not even check these other choices. But I know you are all amazing, so you're all highlighting that we're not, and you're all checking all your choices before you move on. Oh, and I did not finish highlighting. Sorry, guys. So which of the following is not one of the necessary characteristics of a geographical region? So area, how much space does this does the city of Dallas take to cover? Okay, area is important. We need to know how much area. Location, where is Dallas located? Okay, location is important for our region. We need to know the region. Homogene homogeneity. Sorry, guys, my pronunciations are off, especially early in the morning. I never. I am horrible whenever it comes to figuring out how to pronounce words. If I was smart, I would actually look up these words before I had the lesson so I'd remember how to pronounce them. So this word is, means the quality of the state of being all at the same time. So is, is the area the same as the other areas around it? So this is an important characteristic because in order for us to have a geographical region, it has to be the same. That is one of the things that makes it a region. Oops. Whoa. I don't know what happened there. Sorry. All right. The population. This is actually not one of the characteristics of a geographical region. Even though we talk about it being part of human geography, it's not one of the characteristics that we use to consider it part of the geographic geographical region. Which geographical features were most conductive, conducive to the development of early civilizations? So what had the biggest impact on these early civilizations? We want to know which one's most conducive to their development. Of early civilizations. The reason I highlighted development is because we're not looking at what helped them sustain life the longest there. We're not looking at what made, we're looking at what helped them to be able to 
why did they move there? What was important for them to be able to develop those early civilizations there? Deserts are not going to help us. Whenever we talked about our early civilizations in the previous concept in the previous lesson, we didn't say everybody moved to the desert. That's not going to be beneficial to our civilizations. That's not going to help them grow and let, sustain life. The same thing's going to go with the forest and the mountains. Our early civilizations needed water. The water provided them a way to be able to water their crops. The rivers provided a way for them to be able to water their crops to get food. It also is going to provide them a way to travel quickly and to be able to trade. So these rivers are going to be a most important way to help them develop that early civilization. And that is actually it for today. We're not going to get into world history today. We did that in our other lesson. Or we touched on it in our other lesson. I believe we do that in two weeks, maybe. Maybe three weeks. I'll have to look and see again. All right. I am going to go ahead and start our recording here. If you have any questions, you know you're always welcome to email me or reach out to your advisor, and they can reach out and give you my email information or forward the email to me, and I can get back to you that way. Thank you so much for joining us today.